Hello, art historians, and welcome to our first lecture of two on the expansion of Indian art, where we're going to watch as the Hindu religion starts to spread out beyond India and the effect that it's going to have on the art and architecture of places outside of India. And we're also going to see this with Buddhism as well, because especially with Buddhism more, because Buddhism is what we call a universal religion or a universal belief system, which means there aren't really any connections it has to anywhere in particular, whereas Hinduism really does connect to that caste system in India. That's not going to be the case with Buddhism. Anybody could be Buddhist. In fact, a lot of people would mix their religions with Buddhism. For example, in China, we'll see that you could be Taoist and follow the ideas of Confucianism and be Buddhist at the same time. So to establish just a little bit of context for you, India is going to be very, very involved in trade in the Indian Ocean trade route and also along the Silk Road that runs north of it. So during this classical time period, during these time of empires, empires took up very large areas. So for example, Roman Empire and the Chinese empires and India, Mauryan Empire, they take up really big areas, which means if you are within that empire, they want trade there to be safe so that that way people will come and buy and shop there. It's kind of like, you would never want to put your um, you know, business in the middle of a very unsafe area because then people won't shop there unless they have to. But if these empires could keep trade safe, then more trade would happen and then they could tax it. Plus, it made the people within the empires very happy. So being open to being involved in these trade routes, we have India, we have China, we have Rome, and the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean trade routes were very, very important for playing in the spread of the ideas of especially Buddhism and a little bit of Hinduism, because like we mentioned, Hinduism's a little bit harder to spread um, without having that caste system attached to it, although it will spread as people spread more commonly. So we have missionaries, monks, merchants, and military, and all of these things are going to play a role in spreading these belief systems. And as they do, the art and architecture is going to spread with them. And it's also gonna to lead to the mixing of belief systems and the art of different belief systems. So for example, we're going to see Indian art and Buddhist art really be influenced by interactions with Greece and Rome. So just to give you guys kind of a context of where we're talking here and why India has this incredible location, especially in this time period, which is the classical time period, and then the post-classical time period later on, when we see the rise of Arabia and the Islamic world, who are very much involved in trade. India is in a perfect location for this. They're kind of the perfect stopping point in between for people to go buy goods somewhere else, come back, sell them, and then travel off to find more things. So as India gets more involved in trade, we're going to see Buddhism and a little bit of Hinduism spread along those trade routes. So Buddhism, again, is going to be a much easier belief system to spread outside of India because it definitely is much more universal. In fact, when Buddhism develops, it's not actually a religious system. It's more of a philosophy or a way of life. And initially, there weren't any gods that you had to worry about worshiping. Um, you could actually fit this into any gods that you did worship. Um, it's only after Buddhism really starts to spread outside of India that we see Buddha become a god in Mahayana Buddhism, where he's worshipped more as a deity to be prayed to. But originally, that's not who he was. And again, Buddhism is open to everybody. It's open to the poor. It appeals to the poor. This idea of reaching enlightenment for everyone. And there's no caste system to worry about that you're kind of locked in for, you know, a certain period of time. So therefore, Buddhism is going to be very easy to see spread throughout the trading routes of the world. And just to show you guys an idea of the breakdown today, and you may find it shocking that right here in India itself, where the religion develops, it's very, very light pink because Buddhism didn't hold there. Hinduism was too heavily established. And except for the ruler Ashoka, who used it to kind of solidify his rule when he established an empire in India, it's really not going to be that popular there. But it will be much more popular to the East, particularly that Mahayana Buddhism I mentioned, which is more of a religion that fits in with gods that people already had. And you can see here, especially in the areas of like, Vietnam, Korea, a little bit Korea, um, it will spread to Japan and become mixed in with their culture. And even some like Indonesia, although the Arabic Islamic world is going to be much more influential there, Buddhism is going to spread along with trade into these areas nearby India. 
So if you guys look right here, this is actually located in Indonesia and you may find it very interesting. I'm gonna let you look at it for a second and see what you think that this is, all right? And take a second and ponder it for a minute. So this is the great temple of Borbador, all right? And Borbador, um, so one of the reasons that people would adopt Buddhism or Hinduism and later Islam is because these belief systems helped with establishing rules of society, particularly ones that helped with trade. And at the same time, it could also be used to reinforce power of rulers who adopted it. So for example, if a ruler said that they were going to adopt Buddhism and he was a bodhisattva, which a bodhisattva is somebody who's actually reached nirvana, but chose willingly to stay here on earth and be like a guide to other people who needed help reaching nirvana. So if a king was like, oh, I'm a bodhisattva and I have reached nirvana and I know how to get there and I can provide you guidance for that, it kind of established them with a, you know, religious justification for ruling. And Hinduism is going to be kind of the same way if a ruler was like, hey, I am blessed by Vishnu or Shiva, or I'm a descendant of that god, then it gave them kind of credence to rule over these new areas that were establishing little kingdoms or empires of their own based on trade and not necessarily on land conquest. So we have right here on the island of Java, and Java was highly involved um, in the trade routes in the Indian Ocean in Indonesia. We see the development of Borbador Temple, and this is actually a giant stupa with stupas on top of it surrounding an even bigger stupa. So it's stupas on stupas on stupa. It's absolutely insane how many stupas are here. And this was also just like being Buddhist, um, like the stupas that we saw, this was a visual sermon. It was meant to be experienced and practiced, not merely just looked at, all right? So this was actually what we call an architectural mandala, all right, which you've seen, you've probably seen mandalas before. They're meant to be visually helpful in meditation and relaxation and self-improvement. So these are very sacred works and mandalas are very um, cyclical in nature, just like Buddhism is and Hinduism is. And it's kind of an aid in that idea of meditation and grasping onto those um, circular ideas. So the whole word itself means circle. And we know that it's all about in Hinduism and Buddhism, that circle of life and reincarnation and coming back until you've reached moksha in Hinduism or nirvana in Buddhism, whatever that may be. And the goal is to be at the center of the wheel where it's peace and quiet and to get there through self meditation and reflection. So this again also is meant to, it's got that mountain shape of it to represent Mount Maru, which we know was where they believe was the axis mundi or the connection point between this world and the next world. And it gives visitors a literal path to walk, um, literally going through like the eightfold path of how to reach Nirvana. And you start at the bottom where there's shadows and it's very, very dark. And then as you walk around, you watch the scenes of the Buddha's life all the way around it. And when you get to the top, you're literally in the light at the top of this giant stupa surrounded by other stupas and Buddhas who are in this, you know, different uh, mudras or hand positions to kind of teach you while you're there. So it's a learning experience for you. And there's three spheres to this. There's the sphere of desires, which we know is the suffering, the abandoning of desires, and then the reaching of nirvana by abandoning those desires. Now, we've kind of already talked about this. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but we did mention Mount Maru, which was sacred in Hinduism and therefore will become sacred in Buddhism because it was recognizable. It's something that just couldn't have been removed from the understanding of these people. And the mountains, if you remember, are kind of a mystical force for people at the time. They're very, very high. They're difficult to access. And the clouds around it almost make it seem like that's where the gods lived. So um, here in Mount Maru, Mount Maru was this center mountain that had these five little mountain ranges around it. And that, or soon the four little mountain ranges around it, which was kind of what Hindu temples like Lakshmana Temple were based on. So that center temple would be Mount Maru. And the whole idea was by making these temples in Hinduism like this, if the gods lived on Mount Maru, then they would feel at home being on little temples that looked like Mount Maru. It would make them want to visit there and their spirit to be there. So Buddhists will adopt the mountain idea, but to them, it's more about the climb. It's more about the experience of 
climbing that mountain to reach nirvana because this mountain linked this world with the next world. So at Borbador, you are literally walking the path to enlightenment. So you enter this and you walk, you circumambulate it, which means you walk in a circle, all right, and you walk clockwise, right, because that's the way that things go, and you become a part of this experiment. So you're in this the sphere of desire, and then you go into the sphere of abandoning desires, because the whole time you're walking, you're watching the path of the Buddha, so you're trying to emulate him. So by a certain point, you're ready to give up your desires. And then when you get to the top, you get this feeling of being in the light and being part of you know, the enlightened world, basically. All right. So you have nine different levels all right, in it that represent the three cosmic zones. All right. And it's pretty incredible that they have 504 images of the Buddha that show up as you go through this. All right. So right now, I do want to emphasize we're talking about buddhism and the art that reflects it in the eastern part of the world it's going to look a little bit different when we move to the western part of the world so i just want to throw that in there real quick so the bottom level is supposed to be very plain and very boring it's supposed to be kind of like the human realm and then the middle is the life of the buddha and then the top level you have all of there's 72 buddhas up there sitting in many stupas in the middle of an empty stupa because he's not there right so kind of like the idea of jesus in the tomb he's not there he's gone on to enlightenment he doesn't need his body or anything material anymore so this is what you would reach when you get to the top so you have these little mini stupas you have buddhas who definitely are recognizable it's how we know it as buddhist because buddha has the long earlobes because the earrings he used to wear would have been weighing him down He's very plainly clothed. He's sitting in a lotus position. And as you're up here at the top, all these Buddhas are teaching you about what you're supposed to do as a good Buddhist. So the things that it would take to reach this level of enlightenment. These are some of the pictures you can see that would have been very elaborately carved. And at first glance, they look Hindu in appearance, but that's gonna be more because Hindu art will reflect Buddhist art because Buddhism's about fluidity. It's about movement. It's not about rigid and stiff like Egypt. So Hindu art, once it becomes iconic and they start showing images of their gods, is actually going to be modeled off of what Buddhism was doing before. So, for example, we can see Buddha right here meditating, right? So, and you can see him preaching over here to the other side. These are some of the inscriptions that would be on the walls that you could look at as you traveled. So like literally the teachings, all right, and the ideas of Buddha. Um, I just think some of these are pretty cool. I vow to shut the door to evil destinies and open the right paths of humans, gods, and that of Nirvana. Um, only sentient built beings will see the Buddha. It will cause them to clear away habitual instruction. So like Buddha shows them the right path, inconceivable, causing all worlds to be vessels of truth. So kind of just you're reading these and almost hearing these teachings as you're walking in this path and as you go through it. So just another picture right here you can see of Buddha and his teachings. Um, some of people will, like some of the images will have Buddha before he gave up his um, worldly goods. And we can see that because he's very highly decorated. So that would have been him before he found enlightenment. So it really goes through the stages and kind of shows like, man, this is the life he was living in. Like this was pretty elaborate and awesome and he gave all of this up. This is, I believe if I remember right, this is Buddha's mother on her way to give birth to him. So this would obviously be on the bottom. And you can see that it's a little bit darker here at the bottom because this is more in the shadows. Like this is before the reaching of enlightenment and the true progression into Nirvana that he found. And you can see here some of the mudras, right? like the teaching mudras, the peace mudras, the reassurance, you know, all these things that were meant to be teachings for people. And just a couple more, you have the meditation Buddha here with, you know, sitting peacefully in his lap, his eyes are closed, reflecting, kind of giving you the visual example of what you need to follow. So it's it, this actually is kind of a um, very beneficial thing for the people of Java and Indonesia because before Hinduism and or Buddhism arrived in these areas, they were already very big into ancestor worship, which was something very big in the eastern part of the world. It's also very big in Africa. It's not uncommon. It's this idea that those that left us most recently or you know that have already been there the longest, they can kind of be, excuse me, the guides to the afterlife. 
And in these Eastern cultures, like in Indonesia, mountains were believed to be where the deceased ancestors lived. So this fit perfectly with Buddhism because Buddhism was like, well, we have a big deal with mountains as well because ancestors would climb up this mountain to go to the afterlife or they would you know, live there and watch over people where Borbador as a Buddhist monument fit in very well with those native religions because it's all about the climbing of those mountains to find nirvana and peace at the end of the, your life. So the Salindra dynasty that created Borbador that adopted Buddhism, like actually, you know, their name was Lord of the Mountain. So for them to create a huge mountainous shape like this would have given them a little bit of credence as religious rulers, right? So we're going to stop here because you have an activity to do over the churning of the ocean milk, which is a very important Hindu story that we're going to look at in Angkor Wat. So we're going to stop here, let you guys do that activity, and we will pick up from there in our next lecture.